thank you for joining us. This webinar is co-hosted by the Florida Horticulture for Health Network and the Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network. The Florida Horticulture for Health Network uses several platforms to share information and education, and they're now listed on the slide. So if you can advance to the next slide, Donna, that would be great. Please consider subscribing to the network via the website, and we send out monthly e-blasts. They're sent to the subscribers, and they list upcoming webinars, recent YouTube videos, horticulture information, and other interesting events related to how, to culture, how horticulture can positively impact health. The Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network uses its Facebook page to engage interested people. So food action, next slide please, is happening. People plant programming, thanks for joining in today. This session is being recorded and is expected to be available on the Florida Horticulture for Health Network's YouTube channel and the content may be used as an article. Okay. Much of the content we're presenting in this webinar is from research from the Florida Horticulture for Health Network Resource Hub, which is on the website, and it has identified lots of great food action initiatives. You can refer to these on the website, and we'd also appreciate if you send the network links to other effective food action initiatives. So you'll hear the ones that we're familiar with, but we want to learn about new ones as well. So food action addressing health needs of individuals and communities effectively links food sovereignty and people plant programming at community gardens, schools, hospitals, and at horticulture and recreational therapy. These take a holistic approach that includes nutrition, horticulture for health strategies, social inclusion, and community partnerships. Um, by the way, our presentation, as Leslie mentioned, will be heavy on examples and models, and I think this will really function as an introduction to the topic of combining food action and people plant programming. Um, so we'll be covering a lot of ground, uh, but we will have time at the end to share ideas, questions, and other models that you have found in your own work. Wonderful. So this session is being presented by myself, Leslie Fleming, and my co-presenter, Donna Perez Lagonas from the Florida Horticulture for Health Network and the Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network. I'm hearing a bit of an echo, so hopefully that's not bothering others. Um, I'm a registered horticultural therapist. I've had an interest in food security, food literacy, and food action since around 2011, when I was invited to join the Halifax, Nova Scotia Common Roots Urban Farm Advisory Committee. And the, they were one of the early institutions working towards better food security. Donna is a recent graduate from the University of Florida with a master's in environmental horticulture and a certificate in horticultural therapy. She has a background in education, community outreach and urban gardening and advocacy with houseless individuals. She is currently completing her internship with Grace Grows and will be pursuing her doctorate in plant medicine in the fall. So we just wanted to start today by introducing and defining a few concepts that are used by many of the models and organizations uh, that we're going to be presenting. So food security, uh, which can be ensured by food action, is defined as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active and healthy life. Food security must not only include food quantity, but quality and cultural acceptability, which is the acknowledgement that customary, preferred, and prohibited foods differ between different groups. So food security considers nutrition security and the acknowledgement that marginalized populations are disproportionately affected by food insecurity. The rate of food insecure households, which has been on a, a decade-long decline since the Great Recession, was disrupted with the onset of COVID-19. Um, so although the rate of food insecure households declined from 10.5% to 10.2%, uh, this decline was not significant in comparison to previous years. Um, additionally, as of 2019, uh, when it comes to the CDC's recommendations on fruit and vegetable intake, 
um, only 12.3% of adults meet their fruit intake and 10% meet their vegetable intake. So consumption of fresh foods is especially difficult and can be inaccessible for some, with only 6.8% of folks with limited resources meeting those recommendations. Okay, hey, so food action, a newer term referring to a broad range of initiatives addressing food security, focus on using food to alleviate health deficits and hunger. Organizations supporting food security, many focus on particular elements of food insecurity have emerged, including food literacy groups like dietitian led food, school food programs, food upskilling festivals from ecology groups, and Washington State's University Bread Labs whole grain bread promotion among cooks, educators, students, and entrepreneurs. Next. So strategies for food action include traditional and alternative food networks, and these include food alliances, community food banks, expanding number of farmers markets, community kitchens and community freezers, mobile and pop-up food markets, some of these I'm sure you've heard of, along with community bulk buying clubs, food pharmacies, meal programs, seed exchanges, and many more. The Horticulture for Health framework identifies community gardens, urban farms, and also small scale food production sites, including home gardens as part of food action. So the variety of horticulture focused initiatives addressing food security continues to expand. That's the good news. This presentation will be made available post webinar. So we've included some really great organizations that are promoting food action and they're listed here. Feeding America, Feeding Florida, Food Secure Canada, Food Tank, Heal Food Alliance, UNICEF, Who World um, Health Organization, Slow Food USA, Teens for Food Justice, the Community Food Security Coalition, and the USDA Office of Community Food Systems, among others. So I just want to mention that it's important to note that most communities that are affected by food disparities are actively involved in food action. Uh, they are not passive bystanders, of course, and many reject deficit-based descriptions such as food deserts. Uh, many of these communities use terms like food sovereignty to describe their work, which, according to the organization U.S. Food Sovereignty, combines the following ideas, uh, value for food providers, localizing food systems where the food provider and the consumer create mutually beneficial decisions, uh, respect for the right of food providers to control their seed, land, and water resources from privatization, uh, values intergenerational sharing of local knowledge and skills, and works with nature to build resilient food systems. And then here are some additional valuable resources for those who want to do a little bit of a deeper dive into food sovereignty. Moving on to another popular term, food literacy. According to Colin et al., food literacy is the ability of an individual to understand food in a way that they develop a positive relationship with it, uh, including food skills and practices across a lifespan in order to navigate, engage, and participate within a complex food system. So it's the ability to make decisions to support the achievement of personal health and a sustainable food system considering environmental, social, economic, cultural, and political components. So. Suffice to say, there are a lot of intersecting components to uh, these concepts of food literacy and food sovereignty. And we've seen that food action is taking place at a wide variety of settings and institutions. Uh, many food action groups, including community farms, not only place emphasis on access to healthy food, but the mental, emotional, and physical benefits of gardening and farming efforts. So here at our organizations, we are particularly interested in food action involving people plant programming. Absolutely. So how do we define people plant programming? Well, we include horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticulture, 
and other therapeutic services that work with, for example, people with diabetes or eating disorders. We include recreational programs involving plants, and that could be after school programs and school gardens, as well as already mentioned community gardens and urban farms and seniors facilities, college campuses with food pantries or food gardens, and hospitals with on-site or affiliated community food gardens. Also community supported agriculture. So these are really increasing in number and we hope to see that just grow and grow and grow. Several topics involving food action and people plant programming, which we're gonna to touch on, and you see them listed here, community gardens, hospital programs, people plant programming by population, food literacy and education with the youth focus, unusual and underutilized plants, advocacy and research, integrating food action into people plant programs and alternative food networks. So our first topic uh, is going to be on community gardens and urban farms. Uh, many programs at community gardens and urban farms connect people with plants, particularly using edibles in support of food security, improved nutrition, and community connections. Uh, this could be especially beneficial for those who are living in urban environments where personal gardening space is limited. Urban agriculture and gardening not only provide fresh and culturally relevant produce, but they provide social benefits such as community resilience, social integration through aesthetic, recreational, spiritual, and cultural services, as well as the many numerous environmental services such as soil bioremediation, microclimate control, water purification, and flood control. Some of the models of community gardens and urban farms that are partaking in food action include the Center for Food Action in New Jersey, uh, which offers a variety of programs, including community and school gardens with food production, along with emergency food programs, houselessness prevention, and weekend snack pack programs. Halifax, Nova Scotia has more than 100 community gardens in the province. The Hugs multi-site gardens uh, include the Bears Westwood Family Resource Center, which is a delivery site for youth, adults, and senior food security and nutrition programs. The Growing Strong Neighborhoods Project with the Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia provides resources for immigrants to grow culturally relevant foods not otherwise available in the area and as a means of developing sense of community. Common Roots Urban Farms has two locations, Bai Hai in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Woodside at Dartmouth, Nova Scotia's Psychiatric Hospital. They began as a partnership uh, with a local health agency uh, with a mission of combating food insecurity and providing community gardening space and therapeutic services with a horticultural theme. Vanessa Verde was born following the economic hardships of 2008 and since then has created a network of community gardens with a focus on increasing fresh food access through community empowerment, resource aid and food sovereignty projects. LMV values agroecology, advocates for the rights of food pr producers, offers workshops on how to create and maintain both backyard and community gardens, distribute plant materials, organizes for systemic changes that improve food security in the local community of San Jose. <clears throat> and then finally for community gardens, uh, this model a uh, Green Haven project is close to my home in Miami, in Overtown, Florida. Florida. It's a nonprofit organization that creates community gardens in food deserts and provides locally grown food free to the community residents. They also provide educational workshops uh, on horticulture and nutrition for you. Uh, these are just a few of the very uh, many <laughs> exciting models that are working towards better food security. Right, Donna, I think your audio went out for a minute on the screen. You can see the name, but I'll just repeat it. Green Haven Project in Overtown, Florida. Oh, do you want me to repeat that last slide? No, the, it, the name was the only part that the audio oh. was not okay. on. Mm -mm. Oh, um, so we have so we've included some additional resources at the end of each topic uh, for those that wish to do a deeper dive. 
Uh, and this research demonstrates the important role that community gardening plays in food action and how people plant programming offer effective models. Uh, so we have intersecting race, space, and place through community gardens, uh, community solutions to food apartheid, impact of community garden projects on vegetable intake, food security and family relationships, and Nova Scotia horticulture for health activity. Great, thank you for including the Nova Scotia example. So our second topic in this webinar is hospital programs with food action goals and food prescription programs. This represents a very different approach to food action at what would seem an unlikely place and organization. In fact, hospitals have increased the number of programs they deliver addressing health needs of diverse patient populations, particularly in the US because of the Affordable Care Act and its tax exempt status requiring surplus funds from nonprofit hospitals to be used for, in quotes, community benefits. This has been interpreted by many hospitals to develop and deliver, often in partnership with community groups and affiliated community gardens, programs with a nutrition focus. Thank you. This is coinciding with a movement called Food is Medicine, where as the title suggests, connect, is the connection between nutritious food and access. And they're being delivered in various ways with hospitals, including demonstration kitchens, preventative food pantries, corner store locations for preventative programs for people with chronic disease like diabetes, et cetera. And then moving on to the produce prescription programs. Woo, that's a tongue twister. In quotes, a medical treatment or preventative service for patients who are eligible due to diet-related health risk or condition food insecurity, or other documented challenges in access to nutritious foods and are referred by a healthcare provider or health insurance plan, recognizing that food can be a healthcare benefit. And these are being delivered through several organizations, including hospitals. Now, this is a game changer. And you can see the quote, produce prescription programs are expanding, often led by community nonprofits, partnered with health providers and hospitals. Funding for these focus on specific health challenges and research connecting diet to health continues to expand. Hospital affiliated community gardens are delivering food action programs on site at hospital rooftop or other gardens and also off site at community gardens. Now these are being used with a wide range of populations, veterans, children, cancer patients, wellness populations. Increasing numbers of hospital models are using produce grown in these settings at hospital farmers markets in the hospitals and in hospital cafes. Now let's share a few examples. This one on the screen is Chicago Weiss Memorial Hospital parking structure. They have a rooftop garden with raised beds and they're used by staff and refugee populations. And then the next model, Shepherd Center in Georgia, a rehabilitative hospital, which partners with Ability Garden with services available to discharged patients. This model and other hospital horticulture for health activity are mentioned in the Journal of Therapeutic Horticulture's 2022 article titled Horticulture for Health Activity in U.S. Hospitals, Horticultural Therapy, Nutrition-Led Programming, Gardens and Hospitals, and Affiliated Community Gardens. And then another model that we identified from this research is a, a hospital-based community garden, Grow to Heal Hospital Garden. It's affiliated with Baptist Health in Homestead, Florida, and it uses a farm location for food production, for food access, and nutrition education for a variety of populations. It's really making a difference in that community. So Donna and I have tried to include research because I think this validates a lot of what we're knowing intuitively, but it provides you know, good validation. And you see here uh, research supporting these food action models, and maybe you're doing papers or you need references. Um, you, know, you can certainly go back and look at these. A systemic scoping review of how healthcare organizations are facilitating access to fruits and vegetables 
in their patient population, and that was in the Journal of Nutrition. Um, the second one is a pilot food program, prescription program, promoting produce intake and decreasing food insecurity. Okay, so our next topic is people plant programming by population. There are many populations and programming uh, programs deserving of mention, but here are just a few again that caught our eye uh, that inspired us to think uh, outside of the box. So each of these address food insecurity and nutrition deficits with a focus on specific populations using programming interventions. And these models bring food action into reality and not just into academic thought. Um, Kayukturbi Community Food Center in Nunavut, Canada, builds food sovereignty in Ukaluit through the preservation of traditions and community bonds, serving daily hot meals, offering food boxes, and delivering food action, uh, education, all of which increase healthy food access. The Indigenous Food Lab is a professional kitchen and training center working to establish new Indigenous food systems by reintegrating Native foods and Indigenous folks education into tribal communities throughout North America. African Food Basket is an organization that works towards food justice, food access, and enhancing nutrition, health, and employment of Toronto's African, Caribbean, and Black communities. The organization do donates food baskets to those with limited resources and has helped to create over 100 community and backyard gardens in collaboration project with other organizations. Uh, they also deliver youth horticulture programs, have a seed saving program, and are researching the production of commercial compost tea. Uh, Blackwood Educational Land Institute in Texas was promoting this national organization and its event, Sisterhood Supper. And the nonprofit Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture, WANDA, which is working to achieve nutrition equity in the U.S. by uplifting the voices of Black women and girls in food. Uh, Grace Grows, here uh, where I am in Gainesville, Florida, is a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the Grace Marketplace uh, in order to empower individuals experiencing houselessness through therapeutic horticulture community partnerships, and education programming. Uh, guest gardeners and volunteers grow fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs, uh, which are then prepared in the Grace Marketplace Cafe and used to make meals for uh, guests that are at the facility. Um, and I'm currently working there right now to provide horticultural therapy sessions uh, with guests at the shelter. And then here's some of the recent research that you may refer to as a foundation, uh, group gardening in a Native American community, um, qualitative evaluation of community-based, culturally relevant intervention to promote healthy food access in American Indian communities. Black Food Matters uh, is a book um, that I just recently came across, uh, Racial Justice in the Wake of Food Justice, uh, Gardening for the Mental Wellbeing of Homeless Women, engaging school and family in Navajo gardening for health. Great, so moving on to the next issue, our next topic, food literacy and education. This is yet a different approach to food action where people plant programming is being used effectively. And all of these topics, I think you're probably coming to realize are interrelated. Food literacy is a key component of food action for all ages and all populations, and it's another huge topic. So we're going to narrow this today to share some models focused on children, youth, and college-age students with, for example, after-school programming, school gardens, outdoor taste education. Mm, I want to participate in that one. <laughs> Campus community gardens and garden literacy. So there are nonprofits with specific mandates of delivering food literacy program. And then there are other groups with broader mandates and they may include food literacy, not necessarily their primary focus. And this is the case with, and many of us are gonna be familiar with this, extension services in the US and their family and consumer services, which are available in every county, providing programs focused on nutrition, for example. 
So what are some people plant programs where food literacy and education are effective food action? Well, we just seem to have some models for you. The first model is called No Kid Hungry Organization in the US, there it is. And it focuses on education of kids and parents providing programs on food budgeting. So that specific focus. They also do a No Kid Hungry campaign. They provide support for summer meals, school breakfasts and after school meal programs. And then the next model is at the University of California Food Action website. This is a portal supporting events, providing information on global food initiatives, and that includes the university's commitment to its campus food security and zero waste dining facilities, as well as classes on sustainable eating. So this one is a different model of food literacy, isn't it? And the next one is from Nova Scotia, and some of you may have heard of this one. I like to reference it frequently. Nourish Nova Scotia nonprofit in Canada is an organization administered by re registered dietitians, and it has lots of resources on food literacy programming. They have nutritious recipes, curriculum support, guides and templates for fundraising and involvement and capacity building for school gardens. That's another element of what we're talking about today. It also leads efforts for school meals and snacks, and they've been mandated by the provincial government to assume this type of leadership. Food literacy is very focused on increasing food and vegetable intake, not just for children and not just in schools or school garden programs. Okay, in a way, there are more great ideas and models on food literacy to share. And remember, the food literacy topic is broader than our focus on child-related programs. One example, Feed the Future programs from Food Bank Santa Barbara in California. They have a host of programs for children. Kids Farmers Markets, that sounds fabulous. Healthy School Pantry, Food Literacy in Preschool with the acronym FLIP, Picnic in the Park with the acronym PIP, Teens Love Cooking. We have tried to include research like the resources listed here for those of you needing this type of literature, and hopefully some of these will put a smile on your face as well. Okay, and let's not forget college kids. They experience food insecurity and poor nutrition. This topic is gaining interest amongst academics, schools, and food action activists. So listed here are studies on campus community gardens and student well-being and connections between college students, healthy eating behavior, and nutrition literacy. So I'm going to let you have a moment to look at that. And then research on our next slide, or oh, picture, sorry, not as inspiring perhaps as real life models, but important in validating and influencing decision makers to take action. This has seen a lot more studies linking kids, nutrition, school gardening, and some rather unusual strategies like pictorial nudges of fruit and vegetables on tableware to increase children's fruit and vegetable consumption. That's a picture on the left, salad bars at school. That's a no-brainer. And USDA farm to school literature. It all helps, doesn't it? So we have a list of research on the screen, and that includes Charlton et al.'s 2021 characteristics of successful primary school-based experiential nutrition programs. This is a systematic literature review, and it was published in Public Health Nutrition Journal. Then Cohen et al.'s Universal School Meals and Associations with Student Participation, Attendance, Academic Performance, Diet Quality, Food Security, and Body Mass Index, a systematic review aggregating all of those important health components, and research on integrated school-based nutrition program, improving the knowledge of mother and school children. So each one of these seems to have a slightly different focus, but with that same food action theme running through. Okay, so um, just a quick comment about using unusual and or underutilized plants for food action. This is a topic sometimes overlooked in food action. Like for example, did you know that there's an organization 
UWEP. That stands for Underutilized Wild Edible Plants. And this organization feels that these can be reliable food sources containing micronutrients, bioactive compounds with pharmacological importance. Uh, a lot of this research came out of UK's University of Southampton, and they are conducting research on, for example, underutilized legume crops and their nutrition and drought tolerance. Further research by Peta Yehua, I hope I pronounced that properly at all, in 2021, investigated the potential of underutilized wild edible plants as the food for the future. I'm thinking that's food for thought. And Singapore is upcycling for hydroponics, an unusual innovative method of food production. So lots more examples, but I think you get the idea from our presentation. Another approach is recognizing the importance of cultural and ethnobotany links. And this supports food production of these nutrient dense foods which may seem unusual to some of us, but can be very important to the cultural groups that are used to eating these foods. So shaping food, sustainable food future by rediscovering long forgotten ancient grains or enhancing the nutritional value of major food crops through conventional and genomic breeding, assisted breeding research. Again, these are all contributing to food action. Now moving on to advocacy and research, uh, which is another issue of importance. Uh, advocating for food security and food action takes many forms, um, some of which have already been shared here today. Um, but these can also include food assessments like Taiwari and Ambinak Udic, um, apologize for my pronunciation, uh, 2021 Neighborhood Food Insecurity Index to identify food vulnerabilities in the US as well as food action plans. So many cities, states, and countries are implementing these, such as Seattle, Washington's Food Action Plan, which has updated its strategic priorities, addressing community food insecurity, land use, food waste, and community grant programs, as well as Kentucky's Food Action Network, which works to create accessible and resilient food systems through policy change, agri agriculture, child feeding programs, and the Double Dollars program at local farmer's market and institutional programs for fresh, nutritious foods. And there are also interesting initiatives like citizen science projects, um, some of which are meant to instill confidence and self-efficacy in prospective home gardeners. Uh, and as we've seen, support for growing culturally relevant produce, which may not be readily available at other food outlets is a huge area for research and advocacy. Great, so I think we're ready to move on to our next to last topic, which is integrating food action into horticultural therapy and other people plant programming. Now, many of us are delivering people plant programs. So how do we integrate food action into programs? Hmm. Thinking about the categories that we've presented, here's a question. Does people plant programming align with nutrition or growing food with marginalized populations? or social gardening projects we may be doing, or community garden programs. What about donating to food pantries? So absolutely, these can align with people plant programming. Public health strategies to redress and alleviate health-threatening issues of food insecurity, nutrition deficits, diet-related illnesses, unsustainable food systems, poverty and rural community restructuring can be addressed by people plant programming, recognizing that food security is one of the key determinants of health. And so we're gonna share some examples. The first one here, Kingsbridge Heights Community Center's gardening, nutrition and horticultural therapy program in the Bronx, New York. It includes a wide array of plant-based activities in this community setting. next program example is in Dallas, Texas, and it's the stew pot facility for houseless and at-risk individuals. They have a garden club that meets in Encore Park Community Garden, 
which focuses on wellness and nutrition using this type of HT programming. And then another example is Grow NYC, promoting food access, agriculture, green space, education, with a website offering resources scalable for other communities. When Donna and I were doing this research, we really thought it was quite wonderful how many organizations are working in this area. And the next example that I'd like to share is called Cooking Matters. And it's an agency providing curriculum designed to teach parents and caregivers with limited food budgets to shop for and cook healthy meals. They provide education and resources through interactive hands-on activities and digital tools. And now to our last topic, alternative food networks with innovative models. So one area where a lot of innovation has taken place regarding food action is the alternative ways to access healthy food. The bigger picture of improving entire food systems is global and probably a topic better uh, left addressed in another webinar. Uh, but let's look at the models that are replicable and effective. By the, uh, by the way, uh, one particularly strong research that we've been using uh, for continued news regarding these topics is the website Civil Eats. So mobile food markets, uh, where food is transported from site to site and most often to limited resource communities, have been seen in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Santa Barbara, California, Niagara Falls, and hopefully many more. Food box programs, where local organizations spearhead collective purchasing power by purchasing food and providing these to those that are food insecure. And these may often be affiliated with community kitchens. Food alliances are also bringing people together for a variety of programs, some of which we've mentioned here already, uh, and these focus on increasing food literacy and improving purchasing power. Seen here is the Infinite Zion Farms Urban Farmers Alliance, located here in a food desert in Apopka, Florida. And in Nova Scotia, the Ecology Action Center's food project, Reconnecting Food and Community, has helped establish multiple food alliances over a number of years. Farmers Markets uh, connect local growers to purchasers and is another model of alternative food networks. There has been a significant increase in the number of farmers markets across North America in big and smaller communities. Seed banks, food forests, correction programs, and more are growing and donating food within the community and all contribute to better access to food. For example, Beacon Food Forest in Seattle, Washington is open to the public to forage on the seven acre plot adjacent to a local park. And finally, home gardens are yet another strategy for food action, sometimes referred to as gardening literacy. Home gardening can improve knowledge of plant production through the process and experience of growing food at home. This can improve food sovereignty, provide surplus produce to neighbors and family, model fresh eating for kids to emulate, and there's tons of research uh, that exists to show how growing food, even in limited spaces, is possible with the use of portable pots, raised garden beds, windowsill boxes, indoor hydroponics, and compact kitchen varieties. So research is measuring how effective these can be in addressing food insecurity. Research is appearing across many different disciplines in wide variety of publications, uh, case in point, Timler et al.'s 2019 article, Growing Connection Beyond Prison Walls, uh, How a Prison Garden Fosters Rehabilitation, Healing for Incarcerated Men, is published in the Journal of Offender Rehabilitation. Seed Banks mentioned in Torgrimson's Tork article, Online in Seed Savers Exchange, is an article on farmers markets in Western Canada, published by Art Agriculture and Human Value and Urban Food Deserts in Shareable, an online magazine. So these all demonstrate the scope and the impact of food insecurity and the variety of disciplines and journals looking into food action solutions. So I hope we've given you a lot of information and ideas. Uh, so far, this has been a one-way conversation. Um, 
but we know that you are interested in food action, otherwise you wouldn't be participating. Um, so how about we take this time to share some models or ideas in the chat box, um, and we'll try to use them on one of the FLMHN uh, or the Nova Scotia platforms uh, and identify them here as best that we can. So I'm sure that you all have some of your own experiences and you've come across your own models in your own work. Um, so please feel free to share them and we can uh, discuss those. Great, so I'm gonna do a summary statement and then we'll come back to some of the models and we will do some Q&A. Um, in summary, there is obviously interest in food insecurity, food sovereignty and food action initiatives by individuals and communities. No one should go hungry or be unable to access healthy, nutritious food. And there are so many ways to work towards this common goal. Today, Dawn and I have tried to share some ideas that involve people plant programming. We can all make a difference. So we have two slides with additional references. And I think if you want to access these, you might have to watch the YouTube video um, to pause the screen and write them down. Or you can contact Donna and I or the two networks and we can share these as well. Thanks for joining in. Um, let's do some Q&A and maybe we'll ask Lee Deal, who is moderating and the tech specialist helping Donna and I today, if you can help, I can't see the questions at this point, just the way my computers are set up. Um, so we yeah, want- Yeah, thank you, Leslie and Donna. That was really very educational for me. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, there are not currently any questions in the chat box. Maybe um, some people will come up with some. Any things that you might add that you felt like you wanted to, you know, just didn't get into the uh, presentation that is, of interest or you think might be of interest to other people related. Um, Joanna says that she's grown food very minimally for her programming. So she was really happy to listen and learn about the models that you guys presented. It was very inspiring. Uh, one of you had briefly mentioned growing food for treatment centers for eating disorders. Wondering if anybody has any experience and can you share any uh, resources on that? Right, okay. I'm familiar with Homewood um, Health, um, Homewood, Psychiatric hospital, that's not the exact term. In Guelph, Ontario, they do have an eating disorder program. They've had a horticultural therapy program in existence for 30 plus years. Um, one of their newer initiatives, not just for people with eating disorders, but related to food action, they set up a kitchen garden in addition to their other beautiful gardens. Um, and a lady by the name of T Tammy Proctor, some of you in Canada would know her. She is running that program. Um, the Florida Horticulture for Health Network has some resources on eating disorder populations. So if you go to the resource hub on the website, there's probably some information. And the resource hub also includes program models. So take a look at that. Donna, any experience with eating disorders or... That's a pretty um, that's a pretty specialized population. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't think of any off the top of my off the top of my head. Um, it was something that I was actually researching to include in the uh, population topic, um, but I just couldn't come across any. Um, it's it's nice to hear about the one uh, there in Nova Scotia, though. Yes, and now um, the Florida Network published publishes a quarterly e-publication called Cultivate. It's online. And I'm thinking like within the last year, there was an article on eating disorders and horticultural therapy that I did with a lady from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Kate Sampson. So that might be of interest to, um, to reference this question. Okay, are there any other um of your own experiences uh, working with food and people plant programming that anybody would like to share with the group or um, it's always good to have more resources and learn about some more of these programs in your own areas. Um, so if you guys can think of any, uh, please let us know so that we can include it on the resource hubs. 
Great. So if we think we've covered ideas and questions, I'm going to go ahead and say this webinar is co-hosted by the Florida Horticulture for Health Network and the Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network. I guess we're sister networks. Um, the Florida Horticulture for Health Network uses several platforms to share information and education. We've referenced it a few times here, and uh, you can see the website so that you can connect with us. Please consider subscribing to the network via the website, and the monthly e-blasts are sent to the subscribers with upcoming webinars, recent YouTube videos. This one will be posted in a bit. Um, horticulture information and other interesting events related to how horticulture can positively impact health. The Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health uses its Facebook page to engage interested people. So I'm going to sign off on behalf of all of us. Thank you for joining in. And if you'd like to see this again, watch for the recording on the Florida YouTube channel. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.